everyone. Welcome back to part six of How to Plot Your Novel. Today, we have made it to the final battle, the climax and resolution. We are going to be talking about elements of act three. First of all, congratulations to everyone who has made it this far in the plotting series. I know that these have been kind of long and detailed, but I sincerely hope that you have been getting some value out of them and a lot of good tips on how to plot your own novel. So today we're going to be talking about the elements of Act 3, which basically is just the climax of the story and the resolution. So that sounds easy, but there's actually a lot of elements that go into making your Act 3 really great. So let's get into it. And of course, if you are new to the series or you have not yet downloaded your free plot your novel workbook, you can get it from my website at heartbreathings.com slash plot your novel. I will link that for you down below in the description box, but that gives you all of the sheets that we've been filling out for this and you can feel free to use them over and over again in your own plotting. There's also a resource list in the back of the book and I cannot highly recommend these books to you enough. Everything that I'm talking about in this series comes from things I've learned from these books and from my own experience plotting novels over the years. So please check out those resources as well. So just to bring you back up to speed on where we are in the story, we have just had the end of act two, which ends with the second doorway. So your character has now passed through that second doorway. And we had a long discussion on that in the last video. So make sure that you've watched all of these in order. But basically your character has now made a decision or chosen a path that locks them into the inevitable final battle. Act three needs to feel like it's moving like, a, you know, you're on a rushing train towards the end. Usually act three is the shortest act of your story. Um, whereas, like I said, you know, act one is that big setup and everything. Act two is so big that it's broken usually into two parts before and after the midpoint. Well, act three is usually fastest paced. The momentum is just going really fast and everything is leading you to that inevitable climax, that inevitable final battle that has to happen. And of course, what type of battle your character is fighting 100% depends on what genre you're writing. So in an epic fantasy, for example, this is going to be an epic battle. Usually in young adult paranormal, it's also going to be an epic battle. Think Harry Potter, think, you know, the ending of the Hunger Games and how intense that is. You've, you're going to have some kind of actual death stakes here where someone's about to die or you really truly believe they're going to die and there's no way out. And you've got to ramp up that tension. If you're writing a romantic comedy, however, this is going to be something that's really funny, but you're also going to see that character come into their own and sort of claim who they are. And um, the truth is going to come out. And of course, the final battle in most romances is just simply the characters overcoming whatever things were holding them back in their internal journey. So they can apologize to each other or make that final declaration of love and overcome whatever it was that was holding them back in the relationship in the first place. So it's not going to be an actual epic battle, but it might be an epic proclamation of I love you and you know, this is where you're going to pull out all the emotion. And, you know, if it's a comedy, then it needs to have some funny aspects to it. If you're writing a mystery, then this is going to be the moment where it all comes together and the shocking twist of who actually killed the person is revealed. And probably your detective is going to be in some kind of danger and have to fight their way out of it in some way. So pay close attention to how the genre that you're writing wraps up this climax and resolution and make sure that you stay true to the to the genre norms and to what readers are used to in that genre. But let's talk about the different elements. So one of the first things that you're going to start to see in the third act is what James Scott Bell calls mounting forces. So this is basically where we start to feel relentless momentum in the story. Your readers need to feel that we know that final battle is coming. So the antagonist needs to gather their forces and go harder against the heroine. Like like if we go back to Hunger Games, it's kind of like, okay, now they're going to force these people, since there's only a few people left alive, they're going to force them into a place where they have to meet each other. No more waiting this story out. We're going to mount forces. We're going to increase the tension. We're going to ramp up the conflict, and we're going to force a battle here at the end. So you're going to see those mounting forces in a romance or a romantic comedy. What we're going to start to see is all those problems start to come out. You know, you think about Confessions of a Shopaholic, the truth 
truth about her finances starts to come out and all that stuff starts to ramp up. So we're going to see the uh, sort of like those dominoes are going to fall down so much faster as everything leads towards that final battle. So you need to feel like the tension is ramping up, the stakes are, you know, getting higher, and we're really starting to feel that momentum. And whether you have an actual enemy like Lord Voldemort or whether you have just an enemy of the truth or the fear of your character losing everything, whatever it is, you need to start bringing up those fears and the antagonist needs to start making themselves more and more known, whether we know actually who the antagonist is or not. I feel like often in a mystery or when you have a mystery inside your story, this is also where the clues start really coming together and they're coming hard and fast. And this is where you want the reader turning the pages because they're so close to understanding who done it or what's really going on here. And so it's moving really, really fast. So think about fast pace. K.M. Wyland in her book, Structuring Your Novel, also talks about one of the best ways to quicken the pace of your novel. And I have found this definitely to be true in my own work because I was doing this uh, intuitively before I even read her book, which is to shorten your chapters, shorten your scenes, even shorten the dialogue and the things that are happening. Shorter scenes that are really packed with action or with meaning or with reveals and plants and twists and things like this start to make your reader go faster and faster and then they get to an end of a chapter and there's that big symbol crash and they're ready to move on to the next one. So think about, you know, if you've had these long sweeping chapters in the beginning of the book, think about shortening your chapters a little bit and making them really action packed or really emotionally packed in at this point in your story to quicken the pace. Next, what we're going to see is the final plan. And this is something that comes from uh, Alexandra Sokoloff's screenwriting tricks for author. She says that somewhere towards either the very end of act two or in the beginning here of act three, your characters are going to formulate what is their final plan. And after reading a lot of books, where I've looked at this sort of story structure and after writing many of my own and watching movies, I've noticed that the final plan can really be something as simple as a single statement where your character says, okay, no more of this other stuff, no more fooling around, we're going straight here and we're gonna take them down. Your characters come up with that final formulated plan and they go for it. And you know that whatever it is they decide this last time is what they're actually going to do. It doesn't usually pan out exactly the way they expect it to because you know we are writing a story here that should have lots of twists and turns and unexpected moments but this is you know that final plan that sends them on the journey that they're that's going to take them to the final battle so hopefully that makes sense now you don't necessarily have to have them state the final plan it can just be understood that this is you know what they're going to do next but i find that it is often uh, the case in movies and in literature that you do have your characters either sit down to convene depending on the type of story about what they're going to do or it's just this realization in your character's head that you know what this is what I have to do and this is a big part of the story arc I find sometimes where it's like okay well I have no choice now but to face this head-on so I'm going to formulate my plan and move forward then what you'll also see often is what Alexandra Sokoloff calls storm the castle now if you think I think one of the examples she gives in one of her workshops and maybe in her book as well is you think about the Wizard of Oz and this is where you know, they storm the castle to get to the Wicked Witch. So this is, a, it can be a physical storming of the castle, actually changing from one location to another as you enter the enemy's lair kind of thing. Or it can be just simply storming the castle in a more figurative sense, like, okay, now I'm going to go to the moment where it all began, or I'm going to face my greatest fear and go into where the enemy is, which can, in a romance, be I am going to show up at her place of work and I'm going to tell her how I really feel. So just think of the storm the castle moment being like that. Now, something else that uh, Alexandra Sokoloff talks about that I love from her workshops is that she says, you know, often as your characters are moving and setting themselves up for that final climax or final battle, it's what you would call a set piece. And she also mentions this in, you know, it can be often the first doorway happens as a set piece and the midpoint and so on, that each of these sort of climaxes for the acts are set pieces, but the climax for act three should be the biggest set piece of all. And what she means by set piece is in a movie, this is where you've got the big castle or all the spaceships are are out and they've got the Death Star, you know, or whatever. So this is where they've really spent the money and ramped up 
the special effects. So in some way, if you can make this guns blazing one of your biggest scenes visually as well as action packed, then it often has that kind of impact on your character. Um, now, something that K.M. Wyland says in structuring your novel is that some of the best act threes or climax and resolution moments in fiction come with a balance of inevitability and unexpectedness. And this always has resonated with me because I think that it is so, so important to have your reader when they hit this final battle and you're moving towards the storm the castle moment or the final battle itself, that your reader feels like, oh my gosh, this is exactly where the story had to go the whole time. That they feel like they weren't cheated, that it's not some huge surprise that it comes down to these two people in the end. However, there's gotta be some unexpectedness as well that, oh my gosh, even though we knew it was gonna come down to this battle, I never expected it to be him who was the bad guy. Or even though I knew that the murderer was gonna be someone close to the detective, I never thought it would be her mother, that kind of thing. So you've got the unexpectedness, the twists, the way that it actually happens, the way the battle goes down might be a surprise or it might be unexpected because there's a million possibilities and you brought it down to this one. But your reader also needs to feel that it fits the story, that you've had enough foreshadowing and enough clues throughout the story that this is where it was headed the whole time that it just fits together and it clicks in just the right way. What you don't want is a climax that feels like it cheats the reader in some way, that like your hero or your heroine had nothing to do with saving the day and they were sitting on the sidelines and now we've got just this random coincidence that saves everything. That is not gonna be a very satisfying ending. And predictability that you knew, oh, I could have told you who the killer was the whole time can often also kill your story. So you want that balance of, oh my gosh, I knew this is where it was going, but I never thought it would end exactly like this. So you've got that excitement, but you have that satisfaction at the same time. And if you want a really great explanation of what she means by that and how to do it in terms of um, what she says is it's, it's a mix of foreshadowing and complications. And I love the way that she words that in her book. Definitely pick up Structuring Your Novel by K.M. Wyland because it is brilliant. By now in act three, your antagonist or whatever the antagonistic force of your novel is been ramping up and the forces are mounting against your hero or heroine. They have created their final plan. They have stormed the castle and ended up in this thematic location that potentially is symbolic of their greatest fears. They're facing finally that past wound that we talked about when we were talking about creating great characters. They're facing that wound. They're facing death in some way, either figurative or literal. When we hit this black moment, it's kind of all down to this, okay? So now that they've stormed the castle, whatever happens, something goes wrong in this moment. Now, if you remember, we talked about this a little bit in act two, part two, where sometimes people say that second doorway is the black moment, but it can also happen here in act three. I typically like for that second doorway to be a moment of extreme loss that inspires your character to move through the doorway, but the actual black moment happens right here before that final character transformation. Again, I think this does sometimes depend on genre. Often in romance, that second act climax is going to be the black moment. They've broken up. You don't think they're ever going to get back together. And then the final battle is just the, the apology or the truth comes out and they make their statement and proclamation of love. And that is the actual final battle. But in the stories that most of the stories that I write, we have an actual battle happening where someone is potentially going to die. So you have some kind of loss or some sort of devastating event that happens in the end of act two that makes your character go to fight that final battle. And somewhere when they're going like storming the castle or they're going to get to that final villain, something goes wrong. They get captured they lose their weapon, they, someone betrays them or whatever happens. Like in The Hunger Games, for example, they tell them, hey, if two of you are from the same district and you win, we're gonna let you both live. So it's like, okay, we can work together, we can make this happen. But then the black moment, of course, is that they're both standing there and they say, oh, never mind, you have to fight to the death. And so then it's like, how are we going to get through this? All is lost. So the black moment that happens here is the one that is everything has been leading to this moment and your character has failed or the forces against them have 
just become too great. And this is the final thing that forces your character to change. So in the midpoint, they saw themselves in the mirror. Remember we talked about James Scott Bell's mirror moment? In the midpoint, they saw what was wrong, what they needed to do to change their lives, that change or die moment, but they couldn't quite do it because in the rest of act two, they've been fighting those battles over and over again, but they haven't fully embraced their transformation. Well, this black moment, this moment where everything else is lost and they're gonna die or they're gonna lose everything, their greatest fears are being realized. This is the moment that forces your character to change. And this is why it is so important to know all those things about your character that we filled out in the Writing Great Characters video. Because if you don't know what it is that your character desperately needs versus their goal, what they need on their internal journey, what their wound is, what their greatest fears are, if you don't know those things about your character, you are going to end up with a climax and black moment that comes off flat and not as emotional as it should be. And if you really want to make an impact with your fiction, it needs to be emotional. It needs to grab your reader and make them feel something here at the end. Part of the reason that The Hunger Games was such a wildly popular series is because those readers, we all love Katniss so much. And when you get to that moment where she finds out she is going to have to kill Peta, who she's now developed all these feelings for and risked everything to save, you know, save each other's lives. And she is actually thinks that she has won and she has beat the Capitol. This black moment forces her to change. It forces her to say, I'm not playing your game anymore. I'm gonna beat you at your own game. And that's the moment that her character changes when she makes that decision. And without that character's change in the black moment and in that climax, without them reaching deep inside themselves and coming up with that desire to truly change who they are and overcome whatever's been holding them back, you don't have nearly as much impact as you could otherwise. Now, I do know that there are some types of stories where your character does not have such a huge character arc growth. So you've got some stories that are more episodic, like detective stories can be this way often, where you've got a single character that goes through many, many books and and they don't have as much of a dramatic character arc change at the end of every climax. It's just something very small. But if you can still add in that emotional resonance here where they do have to realize something that they didn't know before, even if it's not some great overcoming of their wound entirely. And you'll see this in a series as well. Like you can't necessarily fix all your characters' internal emotional problems in book one, because then where will they be and what will they still have to overcome by book six? But you do need to to set up whatever internal wound they're fighting in book one and they need to have some kind of small victory or some kind of realization that they grow and push beyond. I really hope that I'm explaining that well and that you understand it because this is one of the main things that allows your story to have resonance, that your whatever that internal need that your character had whatever wound or lie they were telling themselves all along, I'm not good enough, I'll never be a leader, I am not deserving of this, or whatever thing they told themselves. This is the moment when everything is lost, when we feel like there is no way out. This is the moment, what like James Scott Bell calls their death and rebirth moment in this black moment where they realize the only way they're going to survive or the only way this ends is if they allow that old piece of them to die and they're reborn in this new way. And it needs to resonate and, and directly correlate to whatever it is they realized in that mirror moment. And this is one of the main reasons that when I'm plotting originally, I do that triangle that James Scott Bell talks about. I have it um, in the writing great characters thing. So for example, like in Deep Dark Secrets, in the beginning, Mariah says, no one believes me, so I'm going to have to lie and cut everyone out of my heart to try to be who they want me to be. So she's denying her true self by trying to fit back into this old world and not letting anyone know what's really bothering her. In the midpoint, she makes that mirror moment decision of something is really going on here. And if I don't change and let someone else in and allow him to help me and begin to embrace what truly happened and face it head on, I'm going to die. And then we'll see when we go through the plot here at the end for my novel that in the the last moments when she thinks all is lost, she has no choice now. She's Well, her choice is either I'm going to literally die or I'm going to have to give up this piece of myself that is holding back and I'm gonna to have to embrace this new me. So it's a death and rebirth moment. And the black moment is so much stronger if your reader is sitting there going, 
there's no way out of this. I have no idea how they're gonna get their way out. But you as the writer have to be smart enough to know how you're going to get them out and that can be the trick. Is like, how do you come up with something that seems so locked that your reader can't see a way out but you've already figured out that way out? And it is one of the hardest parts but it is so amazing and such a great payoff when you can pull it out. And a lot of times, that will have something to do with what James Scott Bell calls the Q factor. So let's talk about that briefly. So this is explained so well in James Scott Bell's book, Superstructure. He, and I'd never heard anyone else talk about this before, but it's one of my favorite, favorite beats to put into a novel. So Q, of course, he's getting that from the James Bond movies where you've got this Q character who always is giving James Bond these great gadgets. Like, oh, you can put this camera in your shoe and like this watch becomes like a gun you know, whatever. So you've got that Q character who in act one, when James Bond is getting his next assignment, you know, you see, oh, here's these gadgets in the car and here's all these things. And then a lot of times at the end of the novel, when he's, you know, over this tank of sharks, it's like, oh yeah, now I remember. This is a grappling hook. And he, you know, shoots his grappling hook out of his watch or whatever it is. I haven't really seen a lot of James Bond movies, but you get the point. Some kind of thing <laughs> that is like a gadget that gets him out. James Scott Bell isn't saying you need to put in these gadgets. What he's saying is use the Q factor as an emotional impetus. Something that you've set up in the first act of your story that comes back to remind your character who they really are, what they really care about, have some sort of emotion regarding it that allows them as sort of like a trigger. Now this can happen before the black moment or it can happen during the black moment or right after the black moment when they're actually fighting. So this is kind of a movable piece of the puzzle. It can come up, show up kind of anywhere in the third act. And you're gonna have some stories that don't really have it at all, but I love adding that cue factor and I'll show you how I used it in Deep Dark Secrets, but it's great to have that moment, like that necklace or those words that come back to you that somebody said that, that make you realize Realize what it is you can do with this moment or something that gives you that emotional impetus, that emotional motivation to change. So it can be a memory, it can be a physical object, it can be anything that gives your character the courage to fight back. And of course, we have the final battle. And like I said, the, what type of battle this is, is greatly going to depend on your genre. So one of the best things that you can do is to study movies and other novels in your chosen genre to see how they handle final battles to see what your readers are going to expect. But basically the final battle is that moment where your character finally faces whatever the antagonistic force of the novel is and they either win or lose. But everything's been coming down to this and in this final battle you are usually going to see your character change and one way or another, this final battle will end the primary conflict with your antagonist or your antagonistic force. In a romance, your hero may come to your heroine and say, I'm so sorry, I was an idiot. I have changed. I'm going to take responsibility for this, but I can't live without you and I need you. That is the final battle. And then your heroine will be fighting a battle of her own of like, can I learn to trust him again? Or can I open my heart? And she'll have her own moment. And then it will be over one way or another. They'll either break up forever or they'll be together and if it's a really good romance, they'll be together. And if they're not together, it's not actually a romance. This is the moment that ends the battle in one way or another. Your character is going to fight the antagonist and they're either going to win or lose. And depending on where you are in your series or if you're writing a standalone or what type of ending you want your story to have, they'll win or lose in some way. You need to decide for yourself what type of ending you're going to have. If you really wanna have that satisfying ending, you need to have a final battle that ends whatever the main story was for this novel, whatever the main conflict was for this novel, it needs to have an ending and it needs to either be they won or they lost. And if they lost, then we'll probably have another book coming after it. Okay, and Wyland says that this is most powerful when it comes on the heels of some sort of re revelation that your character has just made. So this is where we go back into story arc or character arc is this final battle is the most powerful that it can be when your character has that realization, like we were talking about, they dig deep and they realize this is what I have to do to survive. And then they follow through with it and they win the day because of their change, because they finally embraced who they needed to be all along. That's when you have the most emotional resonance that you can have in a climax. So be thinking about how you can set that up. Another important thing to note is that this final battle needs to be 
the inevitable conclusion of your story. So, you know, whatever climaxes you've had in act one, in the midpoint, in the doorway of act three, it all needs to be related to who they're fighting here at the end. So if they didn't know who the antagonist was the whole time, this is the moment where they found out who it is and they put an end to that antagonist or they battle them in some way. So this doesn't need to be just some random battle that you throw into the story. This needs to be the logical conclusion of everything that you've built along the way. And we will talk more about that in video number seven coming next Thursday, where we talk about bringing it all together. The final beat of the third act is the resolution. And you can choose for yourself what kind of resolution and how much or how long the resolution needs to be. I think that there's a delicate balance here. And again, it can depend on genre. You want to give your reader a glimpse into the new future for your character. Now that they've changed, now that the situation's been resolved or this antagonist has been defeated, whether it's forever or just for now, we want to see a glimpse into how their life has changed and a preview of their new life. So how much you show of that, whether it's just a simple epilogue that that shows your characters married now or getting married or a uh, epilogue or just a scene that shows you know your character coming home and their new life how it is it's really up to you just how much you want to show but it, it is always nice instead of just ending right there at that final battle is over to have some sort of resolution some sort of discussion between your characters you get that glimpse into what's going to happen next in the story now for me in my main series what I love to do is I love to have that final battle wrap up what's going on with the antagonist of this particular story or the main conflict of this story then there's a brief resolution where we see like the character beginning to relax and like oh it's over they have the resolution with their friends or their care you know other characters of love interest or whatever and then have that one final scene at the very end that sort of introduces the next conflict and a lot of people will call this cliffhangers because I leave it on that like last symbol crash or surprise moment but really what I've managed to do hopefully is end the main conflict or the main antagonist of this particular story and then I'm introducing what's going to be the main conflict of the second book or the third book or whatever the next book is in that last moment which gets readers excited for what's coming next and as a viewer and a reader myself I love those moments so it's like got the final battle and the resolution but then you have this little cliffhanger tease at the end that teases what's coming next for your characters. But that's up to you whether you want to write cliffhangers, you know, and whether you're writing a series or not. But one of the main things that K.M. Weiland talks about when she's talking about the resolution is what you want to do is you want to engage the reader's imagination for what comes next for your characters. And I think that if you can do that so that they can kind of see what your character's life looks like happily ever after, then you've done a great job. And if it's not the last book and you've got another book coming in the series, then you just want that resolution to sort of give that emotional resonance to this particular conflict being resolved. And then it's up to you whether you want to tease the next conflict or not. With all that being said, hopefully that explains uh, the third act well to you. And I'm going to show you now how I followed through with these beats in my book, Deep Dark Secrets. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at Act three or the conclusion of Deep Dark Secrets. And I apologize in advance, but apparently there were some focus issues when I was recording this and I didn't realize it until after and I couldn't go back to record it. So you'll you'll get to see it, but it's just not great. So anyway, um, we have increased danger and mounting forces at the beginning of Act Three. And in my story, this presents itself first as increased stakes because Mariah and Jordan begin to have a little bit of romantic development between the two of them, which makes Mariah realize that she has something to live for and it makes her realize just how hard she has to fight against what she now knows is an evil spirit that's trapped inside her body. What they decide to do is investigate Haley's runs using GPS maps that she used to post on her Instagram, and they do find the cave with the broken idol that the medicine woman was telling them about. But here's where the new revelation comes in. There are two sets of footprints. So they find out here one of the big twists and reveals of the story is that another person was out running with Haley that day and the spirit that was in that idol was split in two. So their final plan becomes to find out who else was running with Haley that day and who has the other half of the spirit because whoever has that spirit in them has apparently lost themselves to the darkness, to the evil, and is going to kill Mariah. Now, Mariah believes that 
the person that was running with Haley was Lena, which is the ex, you know, remember Mariah's ex-boyfriend, Troy, that's his new girlfriend that she's had this run-ins with before. And she decides that they're going to break into Lena's house because she's away for the weekend. And they're going to look for proof of this evil spirit, which means they're looking for some of those like frantic type of dark drawings that she found kind of on Haley's walls in Haley's room. So she doesn't find that. And when she doesn't, she ends up in an argument with Jordan and they separate. And Mariah says, fine, I'm going to leave to meet with Nicole because I've been putting her off and we need to study. So angry, she goes to Nicole's house looking for her friend. And this is the biggest like black moment twist reveal of the story is that it turns out, um, you know, Nicole gives her water or a Coke. I wrote question marks. I can't remember what she takes from her. She gives her a bottle of something to drink. And as they're studying, Mariah starts feeling off and she realizes that this point that she's been drugged and um, that's the moment that she realizes Nicole is the one that was out running with Haley that day they were all three on the running team together and this was all set up earlier in the book and Nicole was the one running with her and she has the other half of the spirit and that Nicole was the one who drugged them that night at the party and now she's drugged Mariah again so at this point, Mariah loses consciousness, and when she wakes up, she's tied up in the woods, and she's alone out there with Nicole in the middle of nowhere with no phone, no way to reach out to anyone. So this is the all is lost moment, and she's facing death at this point. Now, I wrote Red Journal here because if we remember back when Mariah first went to Haley's bedroom, in Act 2, she found out that Haley's journal was missing, and that journal is part of the big reveal because Nicole has it. All right, so the Q factor, the way that I dealt with this in this book is the medallion that she got and she found that she had at the beginning of the story that she wasn't sure where it came from and that she found out in the midpoint is Jordan's brother Spirit Walker medallion. That is part of her Q factor. She holds on to, or she remembers the medallion, she grasps a handful of dirt, and she calls upon her ancestors. And that's just how I use that Q factor as a moment of emotional impetus and resonance. And when she does that, she fully is forced to change here and she embraces her truth. She embraces her light and her true spirit walker self for the first time. And she is able to have uh, the medallion, the light burst forth from the medallion and her chains are broken. And she's able to de defeat the evil spirit in Nicole, which then subsequently actually kills her friend who you know used to be trapped inside that body. And now she takes that evil spirit all into herself. So it's a kind of a positive ending that she defeats the evil spirit, but then a hard ending in that she now has to take the full force of that spirit into herself, which sets up book two. Resolution is that Jordan finds her there in the woods. They hide the body. He takes his brother's remains because Nicole had killed his brother to bury them on family land. And I tie up the rest of the loose ends like Nicole's funeral. And then when Jordan returns, they seek out the remaining two idols because there were three sisters that the medicine woman told them about. One is found intact and they take it to the medicine woman and her tribe, but the second is smashed and there's a single footprint in the ooze. So this resolves the first part of the story and sets it up for book two. Okay, guys, that is it for lot video number six, which carries us all the way through act three of your story. And by now, if you've filled out all of these things, you should have the main structure of your entire story from beginning to end done. So what we're going to talk about in the next video, which is how do you bring it all together? How do we figure out not just what are these beats, but how do we bring that into scenes and how do we make sure that it feels like a cohesive whole? So we're going to be talking about that in the next video. And then the final video of the series, number eight, is going to be what do you do when you get stuck? Just, so just two videos left in the series. I so appreciate you guys for hanging out and watching them, for all your comments, and for all of you that have gone to my website to download your free Plot Your Novel workbook. It means a lot to me and I hope that you have found this useful. And I am so excited to get to the last two videos of the series. If you don't want to miss them, please make sure that you are subscribed to my channel. Hit that notification bell so that you'll be notified as soon as a new video goes up from me and if you do have some suggestions on videos that you'd love to see throughout the rest of the year please comment down below or feel free to email me at sarah at heartbreathings.com and i would love to add some of your video requests to my schedule for the rest of the year because i want to do whatever's going to help you guys most so please send in your suggestions and other than that i will see you in my next video bye